I took your approach and uh, did some highlighting of the chapter. I also have some little code examples, so I'll switch back and forth to those if that's all right with you, if I can find my R Studio, there it is. Um, just kind of show how these things work in R. Now, I'm assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, though, you are, you know, exper let me just move this over here. You're experienced with regression and this, no, none of the overall stuff is new to you, right? Or should be. Uh, yes, actually, we also just covered this in the ISLR bootcamp. Oh, okay, but great. Not, not so, not uh, in such detail. Yeah, this book is, um, in, this chapter is interesting in a couple of different ways. One is that it, you know, it's first of all, about something we're probably familiar with, regression, right? But second of all, it really does take a more mathematical and rigorous approach to it, probably more than I need, or you maybe need, but certainly more than I needed. Um, so I'm not going to go over the actual proofs uh, in here. I did read them, but I didn't like internalize them. <laughs> so um, certainly, I certainly recommend reading them and, and looking at the proofs are very interesting. But I didn't um, want to spend time going over them here because I don't think that's very fruitful. Uh, so anyway, this is the first chapter of several that we're going to be, as he calls, combat skills, right? So the first, this one's about regression. Um, so up until now, we basically just been doing probability theory um, kind of in the abstract, more or less, but now we're going to apply it to stuff. And so this first topic is uh, regression. And the theme of this topic is learning and inference, which of course is the core of all the modern data science, right? And here he means learning being uh, like finding the best model to explain the data and inference means like taking that model then doing some kind of prediction or maybe looking for recovery, I guess there means like uh, imputing on missing data type thing. Although he doesn't really talk much more about that here. Um, in this chapter, he's covering the regression and the idea that regression is you have some input data and this is all terminology things, right? Input data, which is some set of uh, X's, and instead of output data, some set of Y's, and these input-output pairs, which he calls D, which is important because that notation uses a lot of here. This this script D for the data is the combined input-output training data, right? And so we're trying to find a relationship between X and Y. We're assuming there is one. We don't know what it is, as he says. Only God knows. And so this is this unknown relationship we're trying to find. Um, but of course, this would be, you know, it could be, a, be quite infeasible to try to figure out in very in general what kind of effort it is. So we try to add some kind of structure to the model. Um, and that's this function G, which depends on some parameters that we're now going to find. And furthermore, in this chapter, the, the relationships are going to be linear in the sense that the um, parameters multiply the data in a linear way. Let's see. Um, so yeah, again, the terminology of theta is the uh, parameterization of the model. In the, in the first case here, it's actually just thinking of a, a line fit. So there's just two parameters, but this could be a matrix multiplication. Theta could be a vector and X could be a matrix of data as we'll see, right? And as you've seen, I'm sure. Um, so any model that we choose, is just going to be a guess. And so we need some method to determine which model we think is best in some sense. And the process of regression is to minimize, um, with respect to some loss functions, such that the errors, uh, such, uh, with respect to the theta, the parameters. And here, here's just one example of this, what he's going to call the training loss, um, the most common, uh, mean squared error or sum squared error. Right. So that's kind of the introduction. And then he just has some, you know, picture, this kind of cute little picture. Okay, fine. You pick some model, make some prediction, you calculate the loss and you fix your parameters and you can go around the circle and then you can make some prediction. Okay, fine. Makes sense to me. So in summary, this is what regression is. In general, now we just have a loss function L not necessarily means some squares, but it could be anything. And this is what he means by regression. Seemed pretty straightforward so far, right? And I like this because the first example he gives he immediately gives a example where you're fitting a nonlinear fit. So it's not nonlinear, it's linear in the parameters. It's nonlinear in the data. We're just making new predict. In some sense, we're just generating new predictors from the existing predictors by squaring them and cubing and then taking the fourth power. Um, and you can just minimize that and find a line that goes through it. That works. 
that's the basic introduction. He also talks, it goes to another example with autoregression. I thought that was kind of cool that he just pops an autoregression in there like, oh, autoregression is just another kind of linear regression. We're just, you know, using lag, that's all. Kind of cool, all, all the same things happen, right? So that's the introduction. So the plan here is to, um, well, first of all, what are the key ingredients? They're learning, of course, formulating and uh, as formulating the regression as optimization and finding that, uh, solving that optimization problem, and then finding the inference using those parameters to predict unseen data points. The plan is this. It's first go through the, how regression works, uh, then talk about, in particular, it's going to focus on linear models, and then um, talk about overfitting, very important concept of overfitting. This happens when you try to fit too many parameters. Obviously, if you fit more, more parameters than you have data points, you're going to have, you're going to, be able to fit every data point exactly, and then you won't have anything to won't be able to generalize very well and fit any uh, predict any uh, new data. Uh, related to that is this bias bias various trade off. Did you get bias various trade off in ISLR two yet? And yes, we discussed it in the I think first or second chapter. Okay, uh, at least superficially. Yeah, awesome. So this goes through this chapter, as you remember from reading, it goes through it in a little more detail and actually derives the formula just that they just give you in ISLR two. So that's that's really nice. To, to see that derivation. And then finally, one of the ways to uh, address uh, combat overfitting is this idea of regularization. So he talks about the ridge and the last silver gate reg regression um, and talks about the mathematics behind how you do the fits, which is something else you don't get from ISLR2. In some ways, this this part of the book maybe is a great complement to some of the things in the introduction of statistical learning because in ISLR two they just kind of like give you the answers. <laughs> in this book, he tells you like how these things work underneath the uh, hood, as it were, which is kind of cool. I thought. So again, uh, this is the same thing repeated again, but this is what the regression means. What we're going to do, uh, we're going to find some function and minimize the loss, right? Oh. I didn't highlight this, but it is kind of interesting. This is a book about probability. I haven't said anything in this chapter so far. I didn't say anything about probability. And I think what we'll see is in the next chapter, he'll talk about um, how this can be phrased as a maximum likelihood problem. I think that's the next chapter. Uh, so it's a likelihood of the underlying distribution. That's one way to, you can phrase some of these loss functions. Um, there's also the Bayesian approach, which relates it to probability that way. I don't think he talks about that in this book, but it is something that comes up in like, if you're interested in that, Bayes Rule Book Club is a, a good place to start. Uh, let's see. Anyway, so that's that. I'm going to skip this part about the intuition because it's pretty straightforward. Um, but it is interesting. One thing he does say is that, okay, so we're trying to find the best line through these points, right? But there's different ways, again, you can say what's the best line. We've talked a lot about the sum squared loss, but you could also talk about this on absolute loss, and that will gift you a... Um, a, a, uh, as he discussed later in the chapter, that gets you the um, robust uh, regression, which hands, handles outliers a little better. You can use cross entropy loss. That's commonly used for um, logistic regression and things like that. Um, and then perceptual loss, which again, another categorical one, uh, which I actually can't remember what, this, what the point of this was, but, ah, right, so if it matches or it doesn't match type thing, perceptual loss. So anyway, the point of all this is that choosing the particular loss function you use for your regression is going to be problem specific, and most of the uh, modeling toolkits, they do let you change that to be for your particular problem. They, they have an assumed one for the type of model you have, but then you can change the family uh, to be something different if you want. Uh, let's see. He's going to focus on the squared loss here because it's the easiest one to do mathematically because it is differentiable and convex. So that brings up the definition of the linear least squares. Li I'm sorry, it's always linear. Linear least squares fitting. So emphasize that way because uh, we're going to use the least squared loss function. That's the main thing. So then he goes through the derivation, which I you definitely recommend going through, but I'm not going to walk through it today because you can do that and you have, I'm sure, in your reading already. But essentially the idea is that we want to minimize this, take the derivatives. We know how to do that, it's basically calculus. Take the derivatives, set them equal to zero, we'll find the minimum, 
And that's what all this couple few pages are here. And you rearrange the terms to get this matrix equation, which probably doesn't look that familiar because you don't really see it written this way. But if you work out what all the different answers are, you'll see it's exactly the textbook answer for um, the regression coefficients. And let's see. In, in fact, it's actually better to write it in this normal form where now you've written XTX times the parameters equal X transpose Y. This is the other way you've often probably seen the, the uh, solution written. And the nice thing about this is generalizes when theta is a big is a matrix and uh, sorry, the X is a uh, bigger matrix than just two, right? So if you have more, like in the nonlinear, like in that case where you had uh, many predictors x and in fact just generated predictors x x squared x cubed blah blah right so the same equation holds then just x is now a matrix not just a vector this just shows that this in this particular case of the linear uh you know intercept slope case you get the right you get exactly the same answer they showed before right so uh then he shows how you can do this on a computer. Of course, his examples are MATLAB and Python. Um, let's see, what did I do here? Yeah, MATLAB and Python. And he actually is interesting in, in MATLAB. Um, he, you know, uses this matrix dividing thing that's in MATLAB to solve it rather than using like a linear regression package. But in Python, he actually does use the least squares um, linear algebra to solve it that way. In Julia, you also can solve it directly via that uh, backslash. Right. Yeah, and also you can do in in uh, in in R. There's a package called Pragma that he uses a lot in the. If you, you know, there's a website that has the code these code examples in R as well, and they're all very base R and very idiomatic to somebody who probably never uses R much because he uses a lot of equal signs and stuff, not the little arrow assignments, but um, he does use, show that this Pragma library has a ML divide, which is essentially MATLAB divide. <laughs> kind of cool. And it is, it is the, uh, you know, not, it is the normal, normal equation solution, you know, using this, not just dividing the matrix. That's not just a matrix inverse, right? It's a different thing. It's, it's um, X transpose X inverse multiplied by X transpose multiplied by Y, the normal form solution. Anyway, um, I'll show an example of that in just a second in R, I guess was talking about, but I'm waiting until I get to this part about the um, Legendre polynomials because which I think is next, right? So. Here's another example with quadratic fitting, blah, blah, blah. I just want to pass through all this. Ah, here we go. So before he showed an example of fitting a nonlinear function by using x, x squared, x cubed, and x to the fourth, but it works much more better. It's much more stable if you use the or use orthogonal, poly, orthogonal polynomials, for example, the Legendre polynomials, right, which are just created from the set x, x, 1, x, x squared, x cubed, well, that's actually by Graham Schmidt orthogonization. So you're just creating these orthogonal sets of um, polynomials instead. He, should, yeah, he gives a list of first couple here, right? So for the zeroth one, each, they always have the leading order is the same as the subscript here. So L1 is the is X, it's just what you expect. But L2, instead of just being X squared, is now this. So it's orthogonal with these other two. And L3 is this. So it starts with X, it has X cubed in it, but it has other things in it to make it orthogonal. You've seen this before? Am I making any sense? Uh, yeah, I just learned that I think last year uh, oh, during okay. a numerical calculus. I think it was called numerical calculus. Yeah, that makes sense. That's I know, numerical sense. analysis. I yeah, I think you'd see it there for sure. The, uh, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. The, um, the advantage of using these orthogonal polynomials is that they are much more, it gives, gives a much more stable set. Um, because then there's less redundancy, right? As he says here, you use conventional polynomials as you increase P, the set of these things will have redundancy. It will eventually result in the X not being numerically, not being numerically non-vertible. So um, I just wanted to jump over to um, 
R and just show, how can I do that? Let's see, view share. Screen one, screen two, blah, 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 where is it? I see, here we go. I'm not sure what this does. Does this switch it? Are you now seeing the R? Uh, yes, I'm seeing R Studio. Is it readable? I hope. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, this code right here is directly out of his um, the uh, the website where he gives R codes. So, except I think I changed some. Actually, did he actually have? So a lot of times he has equals here. He does have the arrows, I think, or unless I changed them, I can't remember now. So basically, he just constructs a. So the idea here is you have, you have fifty uh, data points for x from minus one to one, and here's the coefficients for the Legendre polynomials, and he just generates a model from Legendre polynomials like this, right? Um, and add some noise to it. And that's the X matrix, right? And then he's going to use from this Pragma library, which I figured that stands for something about mm, mathematics. So, Pragma. Uh, Practical uh, such, numerical math functions. Uh, su such lean space function is is it in base R? No, that's in Pragma too. Oh. I think I'm pretty sure it's Pragma has a lot of things that are MATLABby. <laughs> lean space is a MATLAB thing. Yeah, it's in Pragma. Same thing with log space. It's actually very really useful because I often want to have like a log space thing. You can use log space in Pragma. Pragma seems to be MATLAB inspired, I think. In any event, um, so it uses this MATLAB divide. So it's kind of just copying that MATLAB code from the book in that sense, and then writes out what the prediction would be. So he uses 50 points for the prediction in T, and um, again, using the predicted betas from the division here, he then shows the line. Okay, so that seems fine, right? Um, it's not a very R way to do it, so I wanted to do this a different way. Turns out you can just use um, LM from math from base R, and you can use this, uh, say Y goes like poly X4, and poly X4 by default does orthogonal polynomials. You can tell it by saying raw equals true not to use orthogonal polynomials, but by default it does. So there's much simpler <laughs> code um, gives the same prediction, but using the built-in poly x4. So if you ever actually need to do uh, orthogonal polynomial fitting, just use poly. Don't bother with pragma and, and all this. Oh, this yeah, is very poly, nice to understand. Poly is also in base R. Yes, this is base R. Um, I didn't know. Yeah. No bank, pretty sure. Now you make me doubt myself. Oh, I'm sorry, I should be looking. Well, it's in stats, but stats is like auto loaded or whatever, right? Yeah, it's in stats, but stats is one of those packages that you don't have to load. See, I don't have, I don't call stats anywhere. So that was, I just wanted to show that. I thought it was kind of cool just to connect uh, what you might do in real work and actually this is this is from uh this is discussed in ISLR to one of the labs I think talks about poly and the orthogonal polynomials okay so I'll come back to R later but now back to the book Boop. Boop. okay so that's that um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this idea of using Legendre polynomials is part of a bigger idea of using any kind of basis functions. And, you know, there's uh, Gaussian basis functions. You can use Fourier basis functions. You can use all kinds of uh, uh, basis functions to fit your data. And some of these things are discussed in ISLR too, especially the Gaussian mixture model type things. Let's see. And splines, those are also discussed in uh, ISLR too. So let's see, 
again the fitting works the same though you just calculate your matrix and you just calculate the you use find the find the solution of this minimum which again is that x transpose x inverse times x right doesn't matter what you do in other words with respect to you still have a linear model as long as you have this form where this is a matrix times your parameter vector not all models are of that form but all linear models are i guess you'd say all right so this is a section about auto autoregression against the same kind of deal i'm going to skip over all that um this section right here about over determined underdetermined um uh, is not only not that interesting also poorly written so i'm well i decided to skip over that too i this i did not like the way he, way he did this section in particular what part well in particular i haven't actually looked at it for a while but in particular this part where he talks about um so he seems to kind of mix terminology here right he starts off um i'm trying to, run, I'm trying to re reload this in a ram <laughs> in my brain um all right so we're trying to solve this minimization problem right and the minimizer if this this will be zero if and only if the minimizer is a solution to the linear equation y equals x not not x transpose x x but is y equals x sigma right so if there is a solution to this which there can be then obviously the solution to this is going to be just uh the the minimum is going to be zero obviously it's just straightforward right um so his idea is to use that to get into the idea of an overdetermined system where you're so overdetermined system where the data is tall and skinny right you have a lot more this is the most common case right you have many many rows of data you don't have that many uh parameters you hope <laughs> right and we know that um so we know that the solution to this the minimum solution to this problem one is this but why do you say problem two problem two doesn't have a unique solution Problem two probably has no solution so I think that might just be a typo, but it seems to go on. Because <laughs> he's now he's saying only if x transpose x is invertible, right? Which is true. Only if the columns in x are linearly independent. Okay, that's true. Okay, so if that's the case, then yeah. I don't know. It seems like there's a mixture of terminology when he keeps saying the unique solution problem too. It can't, there is no solution necessarily if the uh, if it's overdetermined probably no solution that's the most common case there is no solution so i wasn't sure what he's trying to get at here did you well did i you... think he he did describe it uh, via the condition of full rank for the matrix x yeah it has to be full rank but that doesn't mean it's got a, it doesn't mean the minimum is zero the global minimum is not necessarily zero and this right I don't here know, but... But I think I think that. it's just a problem with what P two is. This is can't be P two. <laughs> I know, but you will find a minimum in that case. Yes, you could definitely obviously find the minimum. That's the thing. But anyway, so this all seems like uh, maybe it's just a matter of this. He, maybe P two used to be something else in an earlier edit, and it got changed. I don't know. But he should have said that the, this problem P two won't have a solution. <laughs> Or may not have a solution. Um, and in the opposite case, when it's overdetermined, right, now is, is a case that P2 does have a solution. In fact, probably has infinitely many solutions, um, as long as the, you know, as long as Y, you know, as long as this condition holds. Um, but I don't know. Anyway, I'm not sure what the point of all this is. Here's my summary of that. If you have more parameters than you have data, you're probably going to have a big problem. <laughs> you're going to overfit, and you will have many solutions that perfectly fit the data. Okay, that's no good. No bueno. There you go. There's my there's my summary. I don't know. Did you get something more out of that? I'll, I'll, maybe I'll pause and let you comment on it. Uh, I mean, it reminded me of, of when we tried to do that. At least when I took a numerical analysis. But I mean, it's more of the same. So I prefer your, your summary. <laughs> I mean, it's probably worth looking into if you if you're interested if you're definitely worth looking into this in a different book on on uh, linear algebra uh, let's see the next section is robust linear regression and i didn't skip reading it but i'm going to skip talking about because i already did mention it it's just the idea that you can fit with a um, l1 norm that is put the absolute value error and that helps keep the 
uh, because the, you know, that doesn't turn the square of the error, it only turns linearly on the errors, it makes the outliers have less effect, gives them less power. Uh, I guess the, the hard part of this chapter is we actually solve this using uh, um, linear programming, I think, right? Yeah, it's a linear programming problem. So I just like, yeah, okay, <laughs> fine. I don't want to, I used to know how linear programming works, but I'm not really, I don't have time. I don't have the uh, bandwidth to get, put that back in the RAM and I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with that remaining a mystery. <laughs> Most, I mean, there's so many nice little packages that'll do this for you that it seems like it's nice to have it though. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad he has this in here. I'm not faulting that. I, at some point I might be like, oh, how does that work? Let me go back and look at that. Then I'll go back and look at it for sure and say, okay, I see. But in, in truth matter is I just kind of breeze through this part, skim through it myself. The interesting thing is that this actually is so effective <laughs> and it makes sense that it would be, right? How you do the minimization is not as interesting. The fact that you can do this minimization and get nice um, uh, handling the outliers. Another way to do that is using a student T distribution for your um, model as well. Okay, so that's that subsection. Um, so basically, the idea is that we're going to use we, linear regression is used to set up a function to fit the data and then you find that good basis you find that um uh you minimize the training loss to find what the good uh, good coefficients are essentially although i read through this fast and i realized that there's another point in here that first step is finding is often finding a good set of basis functions or you might say the first step is finding good predictors right uh for your data and you know sometimes it's not known, right? Uh, sometimes it's obvious what basis functions to use. Oh, I'm just these are these. I can do plots of the data, do some kind of data exploration. Okay, these are linear. This looks very linear. I'm just going to use uh, you know linear predictors. Um, in other cases, not so obvious, and you have to use things like principal component analysis, which is a topic also in uh, ISLR two in the unsupervised learning part. Um, and oh, we actually covered it here too, didn't we? Yeah. So we already we already know about that. <laughs> know how that works. And you can find basis, uh, good basis sets that way, right? You might find like the first, you know, most important components in your data and then fit using those for your predictor. I just thought of an application, I'm pausing because I just thought of an application for that something I was working on. I'm like, wait a minute, I can use that for this problem I have. So that was my summary of that section. Now we are really slowly we we're I thought I was going fast but we we're already like falling behind I see um so let me just that's okay too because I wasn't planning to cover this overfitting part very heavily either right so we understand what overfitting is here's the basic idea if you have a few parameters you get you can get a good you know you don't uh the the fit is expressive right it has only a few parameters and you can see that it, you can extrapolate in between the the or interpolate in between the lines here pretty well Whereas you have a lot of parameters, like a 50th order parameter, it just fits every data point exactly, right? Like we just said in the over-determined section, right? We have a solution essentially for y equals x and y equals f of x. And obviously it's terribly bad at, at generalizing. You can't generalize at all. It's kind of completely wild. And, and he says, this is a surprise, but it shouldn't be a big surprise. The training error here is non-zero, right? It's 0.063. Here, the training year is basically zero because we've gone through every single data point. I don't know why he thinks that's a surprise, but okay, it's the case. Um, so overfitting it simply means the model fits too closely to the training samples, so it cannot generalize. And that generally happens when you don't have very many training samples or, um, um, wait, is that right? Did you get that right? Yeah, uh, or the model order is really high or there's a lot of noise, right? Then he goes to analysis of the linear case, which I think I'm going to skip over just in the interest of time now. Um, it's kind of interesting. It does give you some something to something to hang your um, uh, to hang your um, hat on as for as far as how the training and testing error you know, depend on the number of data points and the number of and the number of parameters and the error. But um, you can read through that part. I want to just skip to the. Um, you did read through that part, and I think it was probably pretty, pretty clear, right? Let's just get right to the most, I think the most interesting part, this bias variance trade-off. Um, so 
this he says if this is your first time reading this i recommend you go through it slowly and i also agree i'm not going to go through it slowly now but i recommend when you read it if you I probably even reread it because it's very interesting and it helps to understand in detail what's happening with the bias bias variance trade-off and it's really important i think to understand this um what it means not understand the derivations but understand what it means what is the bias variance trade-off what is bias and what is variance when you're fitting a model so in this case, he's considering some ground truth model that looks like this. It's f is some function of, and this is an assumption of the structure, right? It's a very general structure, it's not as general as it could be, right? Saying that the predictors are, are the res, uh, outputs are some function of the inputs plus some Gaussian error. So that restricts it even further, right? Um, so if, for example, it was a linear model, then it'd be uh, you know some parameters data transpose x. By the way, notice that there's, there, he's missing the constant term here, which kind of bothers me, but okay. Um, maybe it could be considered one of the, I guess you just consider it to be one of the inputs. Yeah, that's what you do, okay. Now, now, I, read, now I read it again, I, I can pick up on that. Anyway, we train it to some function g of theta, and we do that in the same way. We, here he's gonna assume we're gonna use a least squared uh, model. And so again, we're just minimizing this, just, just setting the terminology. And so we have some training samples. Oh, so D um, is, where's D? I thought that was in here, so what D was. Well, D is the set of the universe of all, the omega of all possible uh, training data, right? All possible, sorry, all possible data, all possible input output pairs. But we get some set of training data and training points and we train our model. So our model depends on that training set. So it's in some in that way the state is a random variables. I think that's important, right? So G, that's why A adds is G D train. So a particular instance of that is some model trained from this particular set of data. Uh, and then during testing, we get a different set of data called D test, and we calculate the output for the using the same model we trained on the testing data, and we get predicted values. So the goal here is uh, in regression is to get G train close to F as possible. And if we're doing that, we should expect this uh, predicted Y to be very close to the actual Y's in the testing data. So that's the background for this section. The, the, um, the decomposition, we're looking, the thing we're looking to decompose then is this testing error. What is the error in the testing data as a function of the training data, right? Of this quantity, which is the expectation value over testing data, right? Over subsets of testing data that we draw. Ah, the dog is barking. Uh, of this error, right? The predicted, this is the X prime is the test point, the predicted using the training, trained model uh, compared to the actual. F is the truth, remember? So F of X is gonna be the true value. And that's gonna be, you know, approximately the sum over all the test points of this quantity right here. Right, so that that makes sense. Okay, so the trick is we want to decompose that. Why is he barking like that? Can, is that barking drive you crazy? Or is it... uh, not really. Uh, I have two dogs, and I am used to it. <laughs> okay, so um, we're not done yet because this is for a particular training instance. What we really care about is averaging over all the possible training sets we could have gotten. Right, so what's the expected? test error for our model. And so that's why he does this part of averaging over the possible training sets, okay? So that's an important point, which I hope is clear. Um, so the theorem for the noise-free condition is that the this test error can be decomposed into two parts. The first part is the bias, and the second part is the variance, okay? And just to ignore it's the most, oh, by the way, it's important to keep in mind this notation was G bar. G bar is this, which is the um, average trained model. Okay. <laughs> right. So the idea is, in words, the idea is if you take your, if you had access to infinite numbers of uh, training data, you could just reach into the bag and grab n more training points over and over again. Right. Uh, and you trained your model on that training set. And you, you did that over and over again, you took the average of all those, right? You would get some kind of average model. If your model was exactly correct, that average model would be exactly the, the truth, right? That was generating the, the, the data. 
but if, if it's not, it won't be the same. It'll be off, right? It'll be incorrect. And that's why it's called the bias. Okay, so it's the best you could possibly do fitting the data is still not going to fit the data because your model's slightly wrong or maybe a lot wrong, but that's the bias part. The variance part uses that same G train here, but now instead of taking the average error, we're taking the difference between that and the average model, right? Squared. In other words, we're looking at the variance, right? We're looking at how much the model fluctuates every time we grab another training set, how much it fluctuates around that average model. So that's what this says in words. I hope that makes some sense. Now you go see the when, proof for this. When when uh, this idea of bias um, and variance was discussed in the I think the first chapter of the ISLR book, I, I thought that like the mathematical tools to understand it was probably something like functional analysis because it, it seems to be trying to represent distance between functions and such. Yeah, but, but 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 only in this chapter, and also a little bit from the previous one, I realized that it's not really a functional analysis, no, it's no, more no. like a probability. Yeah, thing. in fact, the proof is here, and if you go through, you'll see it's actually not that bad, it's pretty straightforward. In fact, look, it's only a few lines, right? Um, I'm not gonna try to go through because I won't be able to do it justice, but anyway, so uh, here's what I just said before bias is how far your average model is from the truth and various how much your fluctuations your average model has around the average he has a cute little picture here but that seems overkill um let's see then he just adds the noise in. i don't know why he waited to the end to add the noise because it adds in pretty straightforwardly he just adds in quadrature right here so now there's three parts right there's the bias so the test error that's what we're talking about what is the expected test error it's going to be two parts here the bias how wrong my model is the variance how uh, unstable my model is in some sense um, and the irreproducible noise this part right here and this is part I think where the plots that you get in ISLR2 are really great um, for showing how these things depend uh, let's see we're running good okay um, yeah here's this concept of the average predictor like I was saying right so let's see so it goes through and Oh, let me go over to R for this because I did do a little quick. I, I think I have time. Let me just see. I want to be careful though. Uh, yeah, no, this is more important than the lasso and the ridge. So let me go back to R. At least for me, I thought this was useful. Maybe you'll find it useful. So many emails. So this, I, I thought it would be useful to walk through this because it really explains the concept of the average predictor really well to me anyway i find sometimes working through these things in computer code helps me understand them a little bit better it's one of the reasons why i got into computers in the first place when i was doing science, physics i found that making little models on the computer helped me a lot when i got to general relativity i was sunk because i could no longer model these things on the computer <laughs> any event so x is uh some uh, from minus one to one um and these are the coefficients that we're going to use in our nonlinear model here. They're just a straight polynomial, not a Legendre polynomial. Um, so, I'm going to fit the model. Okay, so what do we do? I'm going to do 100, draw, 100 times I'm going to do this, right? Each, t each cycle through this loop, I'm going to draw a random, this is me drawing that random test set, uh, sorry, random training set. Okay, and here I'm simulating that by just simulating a new set of data using the truth, a1, a2, a3, these are my truths, there they are, x, that vector, a, I'm sorry, that vector right there, and adding noise, so each instance of the training data is going to be uh, different because of the noise, that's the only thing that's going to make it different, and I'm going to fit, I'm actually using poly x4 here, uh, I don't really care about the coefficients necessarily, I just care about how the prediction is, so I'm going to then do the prediction, right, and plot a line for each prediction, and then I'm going to calculate and plot the average predictor, just the average of all those predictions. So that's just doing in code what we said we were doing before. So that's the, that gives a better feel for what the average predictor is. And in fact, if I were to plot the truth on here, it would just match right on top of that, because in this case, my model is exactly correct, right? Exactly the right form. It's a fourth order polynomial. If I would have made it a third order polynomial or a second order polynomial here, then I would still get an average predictor. I should have done that. I just realized after the fact I should have done this as a good example, right? I would still get an average predictor, but it would not match the data perfectly. You still have some error, that bias, right? 
But for each draw, the difference between the gray line and the red line, all these gray lines, these differences represent what the variance is around the average predictor. So the variance almost has very little to do with what the real model is, it has to do with how your model behaves with respect to new data sets. If we were to use polynomials, maybe or for the six or eight, would the effect would be that uh, the bandwidth defined by those gray lines would expand too much? I think they would get bigger, right? You have more variance, supposedly. Let's, yes. let's find out. Let's make it eight. That's a good question. I like that idea. Let's see. Yeah. So it gets bigger. Bigger variance. And you can see, actually, you can see the variances. They can see these curves go all over the place. Ree, ree. They have, a, <laughs> have too much fun, right? <laughs> In this case, it would be it would be worse if the data was even noisier, probably, right? So let's do, uh, well, I mean, we can, it's obvious it would be, but let's just make it noisier. Yeah, much worse variance. Because remember, the noise I also affects the variance yeah. as well. Yeah, anyway. And I wonder what happens around the end because all of that, like almost. Oh, chaos. it goes crazy. Yeah. Yeah, but at the end, it's like all those rays start to not, yeah. not converge, but get thinner. Yeah, you can see like this one, this, yeah, this one right here just goes up, goes, it's going to keep going. <laughs> Don't extrapolate with this model, right? Yeah. <laughs> Although it's interesting, even though my model is wrong here, is because it's, it's overfitting, this red line is still uh, going to follow exactly the, the truth data. If I use a smaller polynomial like two, right? then I get an average line, but this doesn't match the truth data, which you remember when it had a different shape to it. I, if I was better at live code, I could throw the correct line on there, but then you could see that's, would be, that's, the, that's the bias, right? So this line, now because we're not using enough high order polynomial, we get some significant bias. Okay, cool. Um, whoops, crap. I don't know if that helps, but. My scene sharing is paused. Okay. So, I mean, that's, I found that kind of exercise useful for me just to remember that we're talking about the average model, the average, what do you call it? The average predictor, yeah. So something you don't actually have access to in real life, of course. Well, you can, you can estimate it somewhat maybe with, uh, um, bootstrap type techniques, right? Yeah, here's like what he was saying that in the case when the uh, model is, you know, the same as the generator of the data, the average predictor will equal the true predictor and you won't have any bias at all. But in general, the, the model does not equal the, the average model does not equal the uh, truth because it doesn't, it's not complicated enough, right? In the right ways. And if this occurs, you will have a deviation that is the bias. So, okay. And the variance is just the fluctuation between the predictor, between the predictor, individual, each predictor, right? Each predictor draw and the average predictor. It's just basically the standard deviation, just like you expect, or variance, sorry, it's like you'd expect. So this is the same kind of thing we were just talking about. Um, let's see, 1053, what else do we need to talk about real quick? I think that makes, okay, we can skip all this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see, let's just briefly talk about regularization so we can close out the chapter if that's okay with you. I'm sure you read all this and it's clear because I think ISLR does a great job of covering this. The only thing you get from this chapter that you don't get from ISLR is actually how to how to, uh, how to do by hand uh, these kinds of minimizations using the, you know, well, for the ridge rate, ridge, it's not so difficult, but for the lasso, you need to use some kind of, what was it, convex optimization? I don't know. I didn't even read that. I'll tell you the truth. I just skipped that section. like. <laughs> Not reading that. Um, but the basic idea is important, and that is simply by adding this penalty term, we can get the parameters to behave better by forcing them to be closer to zero. That's the main idea of the regularization. Um, and there's two kinds. There's uh, ridge regularization, which has, has, which is easier to do because it's a quadratic, right, uh, penalty function. Um, I forget, I think there are some trades like why you'd want to use ridge. Lasso, in many ways, seems better because it actually sets, forces some parameters to zero. Uh, and the book actually has the same um, figure 
the other, oh, the other thing I was going to mention that I thought was interesting is that this when you added these kinds of regularization also stabilizes your fit by making the guaranteeing that that matrix is invertible. Right, by make it takes all the eigenvalues that if any eigenvalues happen to be zero now they're not zero anymore so now it's going to be invertible. That's kind of cool I thought forces it to be invertible forces it to be positive instead of positive semi definite I guess. Uh, actually not sure about that terminology strike that. Any event, he does talk about how you might implement that in, in uh, you know, directly, right? By just taking advantage of the fact that it is quadratic, so you can just shove it in as like another another row of uh, um, data, and goes through an example. Let's see. Um, Talks about how to choose the parameter in ISLR2. They do a great job covering this using cross validation, for example. Did you have you covered that part, the ridge regression, lasso regression? Uh, in ISLR? Yeah. Uh, no, no, yet. We are only in classification right now. Okay. Okay. Well, he will talk about this and he, you know, he, he'll talk about how to do the cross validation and do this kind of um, testing. I do this kind of um, finding the optimal parameter. Basically, you're just trying to find the parameter that gives you the best test error, right? Again, not the you not the best um, fit error. So, and clearly there is a bias variance trade off there too. Basically, you're, by increasing lambda, you're decreasing effectively the uh, the complexity of the model here, right? And that's why it has this effect of causing the uh, uh, the variance to go down. You're just forcing the variance to go down by forcing the parameters to be small. So that's my quick skim through that section. Um, and oh, sorry, and lasso is similar by using L norm one, which has a nice feature of actually finding sparse solutions where only a few parameters are non-zero. And he has this cute figure here, uh, which I hope that you went through and understood. Um, the uh, if you didn't, don't worry. Um, ISLR does a better job with this exact same figure, I think. But I know, I, I know, I know they do a better job. Well, I'm sorry. No, I, I, they, I didn't understand. You did it? No. The basic, I mean, it's, it's actually hard to explain in words, and that's probably why it's so hard for him to explain in words. But in ISLR, I think he does a better job of explaining it. He has the same kind of figure. The idea is that because the, um, the, uh, the feasible set of solutions is a pointy like this, that when the contour hits this thing, it's going to only hit it at one point versus when it hits a circle, it hits it at many points. So it's the pointiness of it that causes it to pick out only a, uh, a subset of the parameters. Oh, this is something I learned. Lasso stand, I thought lasso like meant because it lassos the parameters in, but no, it actually stands for something. I actually did not know that. The least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. Very nice. So I think that um, you could even jump ahead to that section of ISLR2 and read his discussion of this. I'm not even going to try because I find it hard to keep in my mind as well. Let's see. Then he talks about how to solve it. Okay, fine. Um, the interesting thing here, this shows an example of using this college. So where did he put the data here? So he has this um, data. Uh, crime rate in uh, uh, different cities, I guess it is. Whatever it's crime rate data. Yeah, cities, 50 cities. And it's crime rate as a function of the funding percentage, uh, high school graduate percentage, no high school, which I looked in the data actually means that they're in high school age. They're young, but they're not in high school, right? So they're like, should be in high school, but they're not. That's what this means. It's not like the opposite. It's not not of this. In colleges, the number of people with college graduate. There's actually another column that he uses. It's not here. I don't know why. Um, graduate, whether they've gradu graduated um, college, I think is what it was. If I remember correctly. I forget now. Or maybe they're in graduate school. Either way, it's another higher level of education. <clears throat> and so he considers both a ridge and a lasso um, optimization on this. Goes through all the code, and you can see the effect of lambda here for the ridge for the ridges on the right, and it just makes the parameters smaller as they get higher. And there's some optimal level, which he doesn't find here, but there's gonna be some optimal level you can find through cross-validation to get the best fit. 
regular rice fit. And for the lambda, the same thing, but in this case, for the lasso, the same thing. In this case, as you increase lambda, parameters start dropping out. Some of them come back. Although when I did this, this one didn't come back, so I don't know why, but anyway. So lasso is great for reduced because it reduces the parameters, but it's not always the best solution, um, he says. I guess because sometimes it doesn't regularize as well as you would hope, I think he said. What did he say? Oh, same with this one. I can't remember what he said now about that. He had a Well, I guess there could be times when last was not good, but I'm not sure why. Well, maybe actually, I guess it's just a question of test error, right? Maybe the lasso has less parameters at the optimal, but it doesn't fit the test error as well. And you don't mind keeping all the parameters around. So normalizing, uh, regularizing with the ridge might give you better results on your, in your, in your cross validation or in your test data set. Like if you're doing, which is kind of the, where the metal hits the, uh, where the rubber hits the road. So that would be a case where you'd want to use the last ridge instead of the lasso, I presume. I'm kind of, uh, just floundering here through that, but hopefully, that's not completely wrong. Let me see. I just want to quickly show you, um, just for completeness, if you don't mind, just for one minute, to sh um, the implementing this in in uh, our studio. So this is that same data that he gave. Um, this is from the tech from the website. It tells you how to grab this data, um, and it's just a where is it? It's just a matrix. It's not a data frame or anything. It doesn't tell you what anything is, but it's the same data that was shown there. This is V2. I forget what that is, but he doesn't use it for the fit, but he does use the rest of them. That's why he skips over here. Um, so he sets up the X matrix. That's what the Y predictor. N is the dimensions. Number of data points. D is the number of predictors. Um, this is the, he's going to scale lambda on a log space. This is a very handy little thing from that same uh, function, that same library, Pragma. Uh, tells you, so he's going to go from uh, 10 to the minus 1 to the 10 to the 4 for 50 data points. Um, that's the lambda, right? That's our regularization parameter. And this is just to save up the fit the fit results. So I guess I should have I did with that. So this, now here I'm going to go away from the way the book does it because I'm going to show you what you'll learn actually in ISLR2 anyway, is how you do this in R without having to uh, struggle with uh, convex optimization and all the rest of that. You can just use GLMNet, which is a library recommended by SLR2 for doing this. And it will, um, you just give it the predictors, the outcome it has a parameter called alpha. Alpha equals zero means ridge. Alpha equals one means lasso. And you give it lambda. Actually, you can, it's better than this. You can give it a whole set of lambdas and it will do a lot of this automatically. But I'm just giving it one lambda at a time. I'm going to go through a whole set. Because this is what uh, this is uh, code that I edited from what the author of the book gave. I just took out what he had and put in the GLM net basically, and then I use ggplot because I'm not very good at base R plot. So, um, so this is the ridge regression. Okay, fine. And this is the same exact code, just cut and paste. I know bad style with alpha equals one, and here's the. Uh, lasso regression. Here you can see the effect of parameters dropping out, but none of them come back. So I don't know what's going on there. Maybe there's a, a subtlety with the way um, GLM store does uh, lasso. I don't know. But you might wonder, hey, what's the optimal lambda? Well, nice thing with uh, GLM that you can ask it to do cross validation for you. And it's just, it has a library called it. Say, hey, find me the best lambda for, um, for this. And it'll show you this is the mean squared error with error bars. So you can see it doesn't, it's not a strong dependence on this, but um, it'll tell you, oh, the optimal that I found was lambda equals 18.25 for uh, the last cell regression. I didn't do the, the ridge regression. And you, you understand cross-validation. The idea is you just take the data set and you, um, you, 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 you take out a fraction, generally like 10% as you're test error. Uh, and then, well, like you divide your error data, let's just set like in a 10 sets, right? And then you train on nine out of those 10, 
test on the last 10 and you you swap that around so you do that for all possible ways of doing it boy that's a terrible explanation of cross validation but that's the idea in any event i just wanted to look and see what that was for that case of the, of the optimal lambda and it turns out it only picked the first three um, predictors which were the funding whether they graduate high school so if you grad if, if there's a large percentage of people that graduate high school that reduced crime if there is a lot of funding for the police that somehow increased crime, well, I shouldn't say it's correlated with crime. That makes sense. There's high crime, you're going to get more police funding. It goes the other way around, really, right? And finally, for people out of high school, that seemed to increase crime, which seems to make sense, right? So that was just an example of how you might do that in R, not base R, but in R. And you'll fortunately don't have to rely on my terrible demonstration here because the ISLR book will go through really nice examples of using GLM net and cross validation and the rest of it. So in the labs, so you have that to look forward to. Anyway, that's my um, take on that chapter. I mean, I thought it was a good chapter in that I find it a good resource for understanding how these things are done without just having, I mean, one of the things that I didn't like about ISLR2 was kind of the opposite. It's like, oh, here's this, oh, how's that work? I want to know. And so now I'm glad to have this resource. So, okay, if I want to know, I know where to look now. That's my takeaway on this chapter. Uh, and did you also read parts of this other book, also by the same authors of ESLR? Yes, I did. Of... Yeah. I did try looking in there sometimes when I had questions about how things work in ISLR too. I don't remember what I exactly got out of it, but um, I did look in there. Also, maybe even this probability you find better for for the actual math. For what? For for the mathematical proofs. In this book, you mean? Yes. Yeah, this I do like the proofs that he has in here for the for the um, regression for the rest of it. They're pretty good, except for the uh, my complaint about the section on the uh, over 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 uh, over determined systems. <laughs> but I can't remember if ESLR goes into detail like on how to. Um, ESLR goes into more detail, but I'm not sure. I would say it was mathematically rigorous. Is it? Just trying to think where he goes. Red red regression. We just want a particular shrinkage mass page. Let's see. Well, he does. He does show how to do the ridge regression ma mathematically. Yep. Um, let's see. Yeah, he does. He does. He does say that the solution to the the uh, lasso is a problem in quadratic programming, as he calls it in ESLR two. But he doesn't doesn't dazzle us with uh, the details <laughs> on that one. Uh, but by the way, um, there is a, a date. I think it's uh, the last one. And uh, I think it's 15th of March, where young has set up so that there are no meetings due to yes, they like correct. something. But we, yeah. will we have a meeting or? Oh, we should not. I may have, I, be, I had to I shift the things around a few times. I may have uh, screwed that up. Let me see. Yeah, I think it's only the last one. What? Oh yeah, something I got something wrong here. Um, why does this look so screwy? Oh, yeah, I think you're. I th I think. Oh no, you're right. I took. I deleted the uh, the break. I was going to put it back in when we got closer. Let me look at somebody else. Let me look at um, Advanced R, which I know has got it correctly. So it should be the. Week of the thirteenth and the twentieth, so that would mean that would mean that what you said was correct. Yeah, so we can't meet on the fifteenth. 
So I have to make that the, um, let's pull this down. Hey, what's that, Bill? Okay, it's not. Uh, 22. Oh, wait, but it's both weeks. Oh, shoot, we'd have to wait for, we have to wait till like March, right? I can't do math past months. Let's see. I mean, we'll just have to squeeze that one in, I guess. Come on, man. Just give me a calendar. Maybe log into something. Uh, so, I guess we'll be back. I guess it would be. Um, April 5th? Is that right? No, March 29th. No. Help me out. No, we already have March 29th. Uh, yeah, the, the break uh, ends in 22. Oh, it does. So, it ends 22. So 29 would be. You're right. You're right. Are we okay on the 8th, though? Yeah, I guess we're okay. Okay, so you think I got that right? Yes. Okay. Very good. So next time is estimation. I guess we just, I'm obviously gonna do this one. <laughs> it's only two of us. Uh, estimation, which is, it looks interesting. I read ahead a little bit. It looks like it should be a good chapter and I look forward to your thoughts on it. Any more thoughts about this chapter before we close the day? Uh, mainly that uh, I, I, I have found it pretty worth to, to not give up uh, but I think two weeks ago when we were discussing about continuing the book because it, it uh, since the last chapter it, it turned to be pretty pretty special yeah I agree I think the next chapter is like the analogy for what we just covered, but with a yeah. probability perspective, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think he talks about, I can't remember, I don't think he talks about the one interesting random variable, which is the fit parameters, um, right? You know, the fit parameters you get, the coefficients you get from your model, your linear fit is our random variables, right? Because they depend on the data, uh, right? Which is essentially a random variable, right? And so you would like to know the you know that you, you fit the mean or the most probable value but you'd like to also know the standard deviation of those things as well and i don't think he covers that which i found which is one thing i was disappointed by maybe i'm wrong but um most tool sets will tell you you know what the standard error on the parameters are but maybe you're wrong maybe that's covered we'll see And the following chapter is about confidence intervals, which is also, you know, kind of continuing on the same idea about these random variables and what can I, uh, what can we say about them? Random, or these random statistics, these estimators. Yeah, this is all very practical stuff. I like it. Anyway, uh, that's all I have. And uh, I guess I'll see you next week, right? Thank you very much, Lucio. Yeah, thanks. See you. Okay, bye.